Welcome, everyone. Apologies for the delayed beginning. We're on Arab time today. Um, this event is uh, co-sponsored by the Middle East Task Force of the New America uh, Foundation and the Syrian Action Council. Um, I'm Leila Halal, the director of the task force, and I'm going to hand it over to uh, the executive director of the Syrian American Council to introduce the organization, which is relatively new but extremely active. So I thought to give you a few minutes to explain your activities, doctor. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Mahmoud Kattab. I'm the chairman of the Syrian American Council. It's not really new. We started in 2005, and we have 20 chapters okay. uh, across the country. Uh, but uh, we have also a coalition with uh, four organizations, Syrian Emergency Task Force, United for Free Syria, Syrian Expatriate, and Syrian American Council. And I chair the board for this coalition. On behalf of the uh, coalition, we invited uh, Father Paolo to be with us here and do some activities um, and participate in this event today. So please welcome uh, Father Paolo. Thank you very much. Welcome, Sabah. No, I'm very, I'm very, very pleased to be here with you. Father Paolo da Aglio um, is an Italian Jesuit priest who lived in Syria for 30 years um, before his expulsion last month for his uh, support for um, uh, for his support for the the activists in the revolution. Um, while uh, in Syria, the father uh, restored a 1,000-year-old monastery that became a center for Muslim and Christian dialogue. And he um, brings with him today a very uh, important message about what's happening inside Syria and issues of intercommunal um, coexistence and the future of the country. We also have with us today a special guest, uh, Hadil Kukuki, a Syrian activist from Aleppo. No, from Haseke. Haseke, um, who fled Syria after um, long periods of detention and torture, um, a very traumatic experience. And Hadil will uh, contribute to our conversation today to bring a perspective about um, what's happening on the ground in Syria. So, um, Father, I'll, I'll begin with you, and I'd like you to, um, before we talk about Syria as a place of conflict, <laughs> I'd like you to tell us about your journey to Syria. You, you lived in Syria for th 30 years, and it was your home. Yeah. Um, and uh, what inspired you to stay in the country, and what are the memories that you yeah. some of the memories that you have of the country before conflict. Thank you. So thank you to all of you to take care of Syria, to be worried about Syria, and to be here with us today. Uh, I was born in Rome, 1954. Perhaps there is a background in the family for fighting for freedom. There was the experience of my father during the Second World War, asking for democracy in, Syria, in, in Italy. Uh, I am a Jesuit by 1975, and in Lebanon and Syria by 1977. 1980, I was learning Arabic and Islamic studies in, in Damascus. I still have good friends from that time. And by 1982, I started to restore this monastery in the mountains. It is a very incredible place on the rock, rock mountains and uh, with frescoes from the 11th and 13th century, great monument of Syrian uh, Arabic Christian art. And um, this was the body for my desires of serving harmony between Christians and Muslims on the base of the uh, declarations of Council, uh, Second Vatican Council, that have changed the perspective of the Catholic Church from an attitude of hate and refusal and concurrency to an attitude of harmony and dialogue and brotherhood. 
with the Muslim community. So to try to implement this on the ground, we have worked on environmental issues, art issues, dialogue issues, theological, uh, and um, also the development of a civil society in Syria on the grass level. In, during the last 10 years, this has been slowly coming to a strong contradiction between, because the, from one side, the administration of Bashar al-Assad was stating a desire to develop step by step a modernity and uh, a more participative, participative uh, society, let's say. Uh, but this was blocked by the family attitude, the regime uh, attitude. And the position has been taken in the uh, regional difficulties, especially regarding Lebanon, and to some extent also uh, Iraq and Palestine issues. Just an example, we have worked with people uh, in, about the, on, on the Abraham Pass initiative. You can look Abraham Pass in the internet. You will have a, a site there. It, it, it is built on the idea that people are created not for tension, but for harmony. Today there is a problem, there is a conflict, but we have to work how to overcome this uh, Muslim, Christian, and Jews and spiritual people to work walking together uh, to achieve a pilgrimage of peace. And, and this was the idea to create a real a channel of uh, awareness of uh, engaged tourism for youth, a kind of uh, educational tourism in Syria and Jordan and Palestine. This was refused completely as a Zionist project. And, and, and uh, the regime started to fight against uh, my activity and our activity, our friends. And this came to an end in 2010 when all our work was stopped. The regional uh, environmental region and park was abolished and the in interreligious dialogue forbidden and, and everything stopped. Uh, and then it, it went worse. Slowly, slowly with the revolution has been obliged morally and culturally to say the youth, the Arab youth, are asking for democracy and dignity. The repression is not new in Syria. We have 40 years of repression. We know that. But now the request of the, of the youth society in all the Arab world is clearly uh, showing a, a new step in cultural evolution of our countries. There is a new fact. You cannot interpret what is going on with the old conspiracy uh, uh, interpretation system. And people, even religious people, even, uh, I say this with a bit of shame, the, the religious leaders of the Christians, for example, have been used to stay repeating and repeating the old stories of imperialistic conspiracy. And there is nothing new going on. The Arab Spring is nothing other than terrorism. And the hero of the Arab people, Mr. Bashar al-Assad, is fighting terrorism. And this is the all of the interpretation of the phenomena. I can't accept that. I know those youth have been working together Muslim Christians side by side with enormous passions and hope for our countries. And those people have been repressed, jailed, tortured, expelled. So we should uh, speak clearly, have been for reconciliation. And there is only one condition to reconciliation, the right to express freely your opinion. If, if the Syrians were respected in this basic right to express their opinions, all the 16 or 20,000 dead people, the massacres and all this would not have happened. I think it's just is enough by now. So, Father, one of um, 
the controversies that I think is increasing um, as the conflict protracts is the militarization of the revolution. Um, and within the Syrian community in particular, there is this debate, is it civil war or is it revolution? Um, I have noticed that nonviolent activists have worked quite closely with Free Syrian Army and they have up until this point seen themselves as working toward the same end. However, I think in the past week um, there has been a significant reduction in protest and um, it seems that the fight is increasingly one of military conflict. Is this, what, what do we make of this and uh, what, what, is, what is the implication for the youth activists who aspire to these ideals for Syria? From the very beginning, the answer of the regime against the pacifist people asking for freedom has been very rushed. Immediate uh, prison and torture has been the system. From the very beginning, from March 2011. And very quickly, a uh, side of Dera, that uh, was the mother of the revolution, also because of the immediate incredible amount of repression on kids uh, and the people of Dera, they have not a culture of non violent activism. They have done what have they done according to their feelings and their conviction. But if you look at the cost, we have had immediately problems in Latakie and Banyas and, and Tel Kalach and Qusayr and Homs and Rastan and Hama. So this describes a geographical issue where the Shabiha came on the ground to immediately militarize the confrontation. The, 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 the idea that uh, the regime wanted, not the idea, the fact that the regime wanted to militarize the, the conflict uh, was clear from the first weeks of it. The, the, the program was go into violence, the political center, the political body of the people asking for democracy, will be obliged to go back to old solidarities uh, because we are afraid of those armed Muslims uh, or they will be pushed into a terrorist attitude and they are our enemy will destroy them. So the, the body for democracy has been split in two uh, and uh, this was a plan. Why it was a plan? Why we say that it was a plan? Because we have seen a systematic negation of facts. The interpretation of the revolution as terrorism has been systematic from the beginning. And we have seen the religious leaders, Muslim and Christians, that are organic to the regime uh, uh, um, complex, uh, knowing that this is lying, has been lying with the regime. Uh, and the, negation, the negationist attitude has been used systematically by the uh, media uh, um, structures of the regime. Just an example. You have heard perhaps about the uh, Terry Masson uh, um, Réseau Voltaire organization. Uh, this is a center for, uh, pardon to say that, to sell information. And they are negationists in, in, in root is the man that negate the 11th of September saying it is done by the American themselves. 
And then he he's, he's a Frenchman working in Beirut. He's been completely sided with Gaddafi till the last day. And saying that there was no revolution in Libya. There was just an anti-terrorist reaction of, the, of, of this uh, blessed leader. And they have used the same frame for Syria. And very cleverly, they have sent some nuns and priests to say the lies of the regime, to spread it. And from where they take it? From the most traditionalist groups in Europe that are even people that negate the Shoah, the Holocaust of the Jewish people. So negationist in cultural roots has been used by the negationist system of the Syrian regime. They believe complots and conspiracies because they live in a, a conspiracy all the time, culturally. And, and these people are dangerous. Because BBC has put me and a sister in front of each other on the radio. Huh? And when somebody lies without any problem, uh, the truth becomes very weak. Because people from the radio cannot go on the ground in homes and see what really is going on. <coughs> when, so thank you for this, for this possibility to express and to say that in Syria there is a real revolution of youth like this girl asking for freedom. They are not moved by a, an Islamic agenda. Some of them are Muslims of different obediences. Uh, and we want to create together a pluralist and democratic Syria. The question I want to ask, <laughs> you, you, I'm happy that you're sounding a positive note, but the question I have is, you know, are, are Christians and other minorities under threat in Syria? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. I wrote to the diplomacy of the Vatican in, in June 2011, and I said, a civil war is coming. Take care of your people. You will lose. A, a, a Christian community because they will be trapped in the middle of a conflict that is not their own and is the conflict of the people that are uh, in full solidarity with the regime because they are afraid of the coming Syria, the, what, they call, what they call the Islamist Syria, uh, that is not our project. They call it like that, and those people are the Alawite society. But we have Alawite friends that have been jailed by the regime. There is Alawite communists, Alawite people for human rights, Alawite that have been uh, fighting for freedom. These people have been jailed for years and are now working for the revolution. Uh, so it cannot be, but as a social group, especially on the mountain and in some part of Damascus, those people are. Uh, used by the regime to have a social base. And they, so in these cases, in fact, the civil war is happening. And then the many Christians are living with them, and they are associated culturally to their own kind of reactions. So there, there is a danger for Christians. It is a matter of fact. And when in Homs, the uh, revolutionary groups has been pushed by the repression from one part of the town to another. They've been able to occupy the two old Christian quarter of the town, Hamidi and Bustan Diwan, where the, most of the Christian and the churches are. And in fact, the Christian left because they didn't like to fight in the logic of civil war. They have left the ground because the war was ongoing between the revolution with some Christians, like 
shahade basil shahade many Christians I know them from Homs are with the revolution but the families have left is normal huh? but the fact that the Russian Christian community has not been able to have an effect on the Russian uh, uh, government in order to stop the repression and coming back, go back to politic, to negotiation. This had an effect in Homs. 150,000 Christians left Homs. And all the churches have been destroyed. But believing or not, the shelling was from the army. <laughs> There's no other people having the possibility to have the shelling of that kind. Huh? The church has been shelled by the, the army, and still you have some religious leaders say, oh, we don't know who's shelling. Because they go with the regime attitude. What is going on in Homs? Well, nothing very simple. We are fighting terrorists. Please. But out of fear or out of belief? Who? The Christians. The, the idea is that this division between the, 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 the lack of the, f the <coughs> failure of the Christian community to stand up. I mean, Bashar Shahadi, you, uh, the story is he was denied, he was killed. He was a young filmmaker, activist, very well known amongst the community. He was killed and denied a funeral by the Christian church. And you uh, gave uh, the youth a space in the monastery to memorialize him. Yeah. Now, the denial of the church to, to, to give, to, to recognize him and to, to provide the funeral, that refusal to identify with the revolution, is that out of fear? Do we understand it as being out of fear and it's... It, it's possible in the future to bring the, Syri the Christian community into the future of Syria, or are the divisions so deep that, that we, we fear for a I united Syria? I appreciate your analysis, and it, it's very good. We have some Christians that are, even priests and bishops, organic to the regime. They've been always used and useful for the regime. They are fully convinced that they will leave the country with the regime people. They are not the majority. The majority of the Christians they are longing for a just society. There are people like him that has been working with the society and with the most upstanding people, and I mean, uh, trying to have an evolution toward democracy. And most of the Christians have been with this idea. They want to have a pluralistic society. They want to be citizen like everybody else in a modern society. Uh, most of them, when they think to emigrate, they come to the United States uh, or Canada. Uh, then we have on the ground, Christians have been they are in the army. They are suffering in the army. Some of them are being chosen uh, for the security system, because the security system the used, uh, uses young Christian and Alawites to have their military service in the secret in the security organization. So from the start point, before the revolution, many Christians were already in the security system because the regime chooses the pupils of the minorities to have the security on their side. So they are already in the system. Huh? How, what they can do when they are in the system and with washing brain uh, active, uh, very active from the regime until now. And then we have Christians been jailed. Christians have been tortured. Not from now, from years. Huh? And, and Today, many are active on the ground, not many of them with weapons in their hands, 
is not that culture. When you are a minority in a situation like Syria, it's not that culture. But they are active in, in thinking, in politics, in organization, in helping people, in assisting displaced people, working for the health of people. I have in my mind a girl of Damascus. She was very much with the regime, culturally, psychologically. And then slowly, slowly she shifted and she started to buy uh, um, medicine from the pharmacies and to send it on the ground where the people are repressed. I think this is a good uh, moment to bring in Hadil. Um, do you want to say a few words about your story and comment on anything that you've heard fa the father say? Um, first, uh, I would like to thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity to be here and talk about my story, which is the same of a lot of stories of a lot of activists in Syria. Um, I would ask you to excuse my English. I'm new here. My English is not that good. When did you arrive? Uh, I arrived here about uh, 20 days ago. Yeah. And you left Syria when? Uh, I left Syria about uh, seven months ago. Yeah. Uh, my story uh, mm, started last year when I was 19. Uh, I am from Al uh, Hasake, which is in the northeast of Syria. I am a student uh, in Aleppo University. I was studying law and English literature. Uh, uh, at the beginning of, of March, me and my friends, uh, my colleagues in Aleppo University, uh, exactly on uh, 10 of March, we distributed leaflets in Aleppo streets, calling on people to go and demonstrate against the dictatorship, calling on a, on a real parliament, on um, on freedom, on a new Syria, without this dictatorship. Two days later, they arrested me with my colleagues. Uh, they arrested us and kept us in jail for about 40 days. Uh, we were in jail, then the revolution started in Dara. After that, after these 40 days of suffering, torturing, they released us. I came back to my university as my colleagues, but we completed our activities with our colleagues in Aleppo University, which, which is very active in the revolution. Um, after that, in, uh, after maybe about uh, in August, in August 2011, uh, they arrested me again from a demonstration in Aleppo. Uh, they arrested me and kept me in, a, in another uh, security center. Uh, in the second time, they tortured me a lot, more than the first time. Uh, maybe they tortured me more than any other people because I belong to, to a minority. I'm a Christian girl, the, and the, as everyone can see the regime always want to show the revolution as a extremist Sunni revolution, which is not true. Because of that, they always want to like to 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 let the, the other minorities as Christians, Alawite, and others to be always afraid of involving in the revolution. They kept me in jail for about 15 days. Then they released me again and arrested me for the third time all for also the same reasons for my activities in the revolution. Me and my colleagues were helping the injured people in Idlib, which is in the north of Syria. Uh, we were like uh, helping the injured people in the demonstrations because we uh, always the regime banned us of taking the injured people to hospitals as one of my friends said, if, if we take an uh, injured person in the demonstration to a hospital with a bullet in his hand, then he will get out of the hospital with a bullet in his head. Then we help them uh, at like small hospitals in homes. 
After that, I was in a real danger of the regime because of all what happened. Uh, I was obliged to escape from the country after they deprived me from my university. I was banned of going to the university. Sorry, I was banned of going to the university. I was banned to, of uh, even leaving my my uh, own city, which is Hasake. I decided to go out. Uh, then the Free Syrian Army helped me to get out of Syria uh, f uh, by the Turkish borders. The Free Army, which the majority of it are Sunni, and always the regime claimed that they are extremist Sunni people, they helped me, me, the Christian girl, while I was in danger from the regime, the regime which it arrested uh, my father after, after when I left uh, the country, the, my, my family suffered a lot and still suffer, suffering in Syria because of this regime uh, who always claim that he protects the, uh, the minorities which is not true at all. I was with my colleagues. Uh, we were mm, Christians, Muslims, and we never asked, what is your religion? Uh, I never felt in a, in a, from a bad like behaviors from other Sunni people in the revolution. Hadil, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What, one of the vexing questions uh, that um, makes people very worried about the future of Syria is the disunity of the opposition. Yeah. And I want to hear from you as a youth activist about your thoughts, um, before I open it for questions to the audience, about your thoughts about future leadership in Syria. You know, I, I'm not an expert in the political issues. Yeah, but I, I was just an activist uh, inside Syria, me and the other guys and girls, the activists in Syria, we were really unit. We had just one goal, to, to reach freedom Syria. So it doesn't matter if, if the, the opposition outside are not united. Okay, um, so we'll open it now for some questions. Uh, we'll start here, the, the doc uh, doctor. In the gray, yes, please. Uh, <coughs> the Syrian regime has been described, and rightly so, as being brutal. And you have elaborated, Father, on this uh, issue quite well. And uh, you seem to indicate that the brutality, the opposite brutality, the, the resort to violence was a result of regime's investigation. The most prudent, in my judgment, of the Syrian oppositions have declared themselves against resorting to violence, against foreign intervention, and against inciting sectarian feelings. The the Christians of uh, Homs, for example, that you, you mentioned, uh, you seem to say that they have left by their own will because, the, uh, because of, the of, of the war condition. I was a couple of days ago on, uh, on BBC, and a friend of mine, Dr. Joe Afram, a surgeon that many of you of the Syrian community would probably know, uh, heard and was a little bit disappointed with my performance. I was, on the other side was uh, Mr. Al-Assad. Can Al -Assad. you ask a question, please, sir? No, the, the question is that the, the Christians, his description is that the Christians who left, left at gun points and churches were uh, occupied. And is this the way to democracy? Is this the way to, to really achieve the Syria that we want? Is this a way to respond to a regime that is uh, bent on violence and that's what he does best? 
Are you saying that they, they, were, they were forced out at gunpoint by the, by, by the, the free, the free army. army? If you let me read his, uh, his email to me, I will tell you. He said, my family, my sister and her children and grandchildren, 11 people were forced by gunpoint by the Free Syrian Army. Okay. And then the, our church, the, the Imbizonar Church of the, Christ, of the Syrian uh, Orthodox Church, were also was desecrated and was uh, occupied. This is not a way to democracy. Uh, just a question. When was this? When was that? What date? Uh, it was in March. They, they have left. March what? When, what tw date? He, 12. Uh, 12. It, it, yesterday. What do you mean what date? It, to me, I think it Which matters. Month? Which month? Which March month? March. His, his sister and her family were vacated and the rest have, uh, okay. have followed. But those who resisted were killed immediately on the spot. Okay, I'm, I'm going to take two more questions. You, you have the names of those who have been killed on the spot by the revolutionaries? Well, I'll, I'll read you. This is Mr. Joe Afram. I'll give you a Okay, 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 okay. okay. We, we, we... Can I get a question, No, it's... Yes, here. Yeah, Bill Jones from Executive Intelligence Review. I'd like to return to the issue of the opposition, the nature of the opposition. And obviously, it's, it's a very mixed bag. Uh, you have good guys, you have people who are out in the street because of the oppression, because of their hatred of the regime, and you have a lot of other people who have other motives who want to reshape the Middle East and Syria in their own light. Uh, this also could represent a danger to uh, the ethnic divisions, uh, whatever you want to say about uh, the Assad regime. There was at least stability in terms of uh, the ethnic violence. Question is, is that going to remain? People have a lot of questions about this. And we're assured by the Western press that uh, it's always it's the good guys who are in charge. But I'm not really sure that that's the case. And a lot of people are very concerned what will happen if that isn't the case. And secondly, you've been getting a lot of support from the international community or from the Western community, let me put it that way, uh, who are doing that not so much in terms of their love for democracy and love for a free Syria, but there's a geopolitical game going on in which the issue is the Middle East and Iran. And the support that has been given to the opposition in trying to get rid of Assad, and, and they didn't want to negotiate, nobody wanted to negotiate with him, they wanted him out, would be an attack in order to undermine Iran. So in one sense, there's also a game being played in which the Syrian opposition is becoming something of a guinea pig in a, in a greater play. And I'd like you, you to uh, really... I know, I know. I'm going to let you answer both of these questions before we bring in more. There is plenty of analysis in the world saying Syria is a spot of regional conflicts, is an issue of geostrategic equilibrium. This is partly true. I agree with you. But there is an element that is seldom taken seriously into consideration. There is a new tree, and this is the Arabic youth saying enough is enough. I know for cynic, cynic analysts of political realism, this is difficult to be accepted. They can't accept ideals in youth people. They always should believe and see how this has been used by somebody and built by calculation. But it's not like that. People are standing for freedom in all the Arab world. They are Sunni and they are Shiite. I want to uh, say that Bahrain people, although being <laughs> and being Shiite, they have the same right of the people of Syria, mostly Sunni, to have the freedom. Then when you are on the ground and under repression, then there is all the other stuff that come in today. Syria is a, an enormous regional issue and a geostrategical global question. So we ask, we beg from the powers, uh, United States, Russia, China, Iran, uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, to try once again to agree that the Syrian people have the right to achieve democracy and a pluralistic democracy. And the other should help and not make of our country a ring for the conflicts. 
than for Homs. Uh, it is difficult by words to address the organization of lying. So there is not much to do. I can just oppose my word to yours, and people will be obliged to, to stay in the middle. And in the middle is not truth. I say to the journalists this, this superficially, say, I have heard this, and I have heard this. Somewhere in the middle should be truth is not true. You should seek to understand what's really happening. The Christian part of Homs was occupied by the army, repressing the people. And it was one chapter of the fight to free Homs from the side of people that are defending themselves and fighting their fight to win the revolution. Uh, I cannot exclude that in some cases there has been case uh, of violence that can be interpreted as confessional hate. Uh, there is a fact some little groups in this terrible winter of Syria that was not only dangerous, was also very cold. There was groups on board that are not depending from the Syrian Free Army. In the older region of Homs, there is people that are clandestine. And when you know that the regime of Assad has been using people of Qaeda in Iraq and in Lebanon, you cannot be astonished that those people are now around again, doing their own program and agenda. But for Homs, is not true. The apostolic nuns having direct access to the information on the ground from his priests in Homs, has declared in an important meeting of organization uh, gathering in the Vatican. You can check this in internet, uh, where the question was raised in the terms you, sir, have been raising. And he said, no, we have not assisted to confessional aggression and violence from the revolution against the Christian, not even in Homs. And the church has been destroyed by the shelling. The, 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 uh, the people in the army have been in the courtyard of the church, but they didn't desecrate the churches. The church has been desecrated by the shelling from the uh, tanks and from the uh, uh, heavy artillery of, of, the, of, the, of the army. I have to say this because it's true. And I'm happy to say that the apostolic nuns confirm that in official state. Okay. Um, oh, oh, no. yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming here, Father Paolo and dear Hadil. Uh, I'm Ola Abdel Hamid, I'm Syrian. Um, and I left my country like seven years ago, <coughs> political refugee, uh, with my family. My question is for, for both of you, please, if you can answer it, about international intervention, about what do you think uh, we can do in Syria as a, a, an international community? Personally, I believe that we exhausted all the scenarios uh, and we need international intervention to stop Assad from killing. He's now in Damascus and Aleppo, as we know. Uh, also, I'd like to ask you, Hadil, the same question, but what do you think the Christian youth uh, want from the international community exactly now after, you know, the uh, major attacks in Damascus and Aleppo recently? Thank you very much for coming. Uh, we're running um, short of time, uh, so I'm going to ask the gentleman in the orange to ask a question. So. We Thank you again for uh, <clears throat> this enlightening uh, talk. However, I have some troubling questions that uh, have been bothering me for a long time. I've you been in this country um, for... Succinctly, please, okay, sir. Okay. 52 years I've been here, but I have relatives there, and my town, Blue Dan, is a suburb of Damascus, 30 miles away. And from day one, I had been told by my relatives over there that the Saudis were paying every person $500 to, 
to go in and demonstrate against the government. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay, this has been documented. Okay. All right. Wait. Let, let me finish. Let me finish. I'm, I'm no, 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 no. You have the right to repeat the lies of the regime, okay. and we are have obliged to hear you in a proper way. Okay. So that's what I heard first. Then later on, later on, the Saudis and the Qataris have hijacked the Arab League meeting and expelled Syria on illegal ground, but that's besides the point. And furthermore, they continue to supply arms uh, openly. Do you have a question? My question is, how can they... Everyone has a question. We have okay. many okay. questions. Look, it's part of the discussion. Uh, I will not stand for any uh, comments like this, please. I am telling you what I heard, and I would like to know the answer. The question is, our government here keeps supporting the Saudi effort in supplying arms to the rebels at the same time they are asking the regime to stop killing. Well, if you want to stop the killing, you have to preach on both sides. Okay, thank you. Okay? All right, um, please. Um. You want to answer to this question <laughs> of money to the demonstrators? How much uh, they paid you? <laughs> uh, they, they paid nothing for me, and they paid nothing for the other activists. You know, uh, we, we go to demonstrations, and, and maybe we will die there. Everyone go to, to a demonstration, uh, knows that he could die in the demonstrations. They, they went with their families. They, they, a lot of people lost members of their families. They lost their their Home their family. homes. They lost every everything. They are not losing everything for some money. They are lo losing everything for the free Syria. Do you want to answer the question about intervention? Yeah, about the intervention. Uh, I I said I'm not uh, an expert, a political expert, but I think it's. Unfortunately, the only way now to, to, to reach to our goal, because the violence of the regime is more and more every day. So, of course, we need some help to uh, at least to support uh, the Free Syrian Army with, with weapons. We need a free zone area. I think it, it is the, those are necessities now. On the same, on the same issue, from September 2011, I asked the international community to be uh, coherent, consistent, sending in a non-violent concept of intervention thousands, and I, I said a biblical number, 50,000 uh, peacekeepers, non-violent peacekeepers, in order to see if really the regime want to bring back uh, the political space for a democratic discussion on the future of Syria. Now, when we have on the ground effect of civil war in the west of Syria and facts of civil war in some parts of Damascus, we need uh, also Russia a, in an agreement to send uh, the, um, the army of the United Nations to separate and protect civilians from the civil war. And then, again, I say, we need the international civil society sending uh, peacekeepers, activists to help the society, the civil society, to go into democracy in the right way. So uh, being side by side with the Syrian people in this uh, um, intermediate uh, time where the regime should be taken away. And they say, OK, this is ideals, because Russia is not coping with this, is not working with that. So the effect on the ground is that the uh, Syrian Free Army defending the people are winning the war. But it's the interest of Syria and the interest 
of the youth using the weapons and the interest of the international society and the interest of Israel and the interest of everybody to stop the killing and open the floor for democratic process. How do we do that? <laughs> it, 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 I'm up to my mind is really an issue to reinforce the, the people that in the free army are more aware, more under control, more organized, more able to be correct on human base, to respect human rights, uh, and, uh, and so far, and asking in the same time, asking, asking again and again and again the international community to come on the ground with the United Nations uh, uh, forces. As, a, as peacekeepers? As, as peacekeepers, separating the people on the ground. We have to protect today the Sunnis that are killed by the Shabiha, and tomorrow to protect the families of the Shabiha. Because this. Okay. Okay, we, we have. Sorry? Uh, I'm going to let this gentleman in the blue shirt ask his question and Thank then we'll you. go to the back. So, very quick, I'm a Syrian Christian. Uh, most of my relatives are in Homs, and they tell me first, Muzanar church was bombed by the regime. A lot of churches were robbed by the regime, thugs. None of the uh, rebels, they touched the, the demonstrators in, uh, or the, the Christians in, in, in the city of Homs. In contrast, a lot of uh, Christian fellows, my friends, my relatives, are arrested and tortured brutally by Assad regime. I, want, I, I am one of them. I arrested five years ago. Back then, there were no uh, international conspiracy, no Saudi conspiracy, and they arrested us and they, they, they uh, uh, severely tortured us just because we were secular. We called for a democratic Syria, for a pluralistic Syria. We can't expect from a regime that Herbert, terrorist organization like Hezbollah, to be a, a, a pro or protecting for the minority. My question to Hadil, since she was with the rebels, I mean, do you think that the, the alternative in Syria would be Islamic one? You've met with a lot of activists. I mean, would you tell us more about that? Before that question, we have this woman in the back. Okay. Hey, Can you identify yourself, please? Uh, Jennifer Quigley-Jones. Um, I'm writing a piece on the role of the torture of children in and assessing whether it stimulated further protests and revolutions. So I was wondering whether you, what impact do you think the torture, detention, and killing of about 1,500 children currently has had on the protest movement. Thank you. Okay, uh, one more question um, to, to the right here. This is a question for uh, Father Paolo. You were. Can you identify yourself? Sorry. Uh, my name is Armin Rosen, and um, I'm a writer for uh, The Atlantic Online. Um, and you were in Syria fairly recently, uh, and I'm wondering sort of what your sense is of like the military capabilities of the Free Syrian Army. Uh, whether you think that they do have the ability to overthrow the regime, uh, hold territory, and whether they can kind of hold out long enough uh, if there is eventually an international intervention. Okay. Do, he's, he's asking you about the strength of the Free Syrian Army. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, let's hear Hadil first. Yes. Uh, um, about uh, the alternative uh, after uh, Assad regime, uh, I would say the, the alternative could be uh, maybe a, a Islamic regime, but of course it will be moderate Islamic regime because um, Muslims people in Syria are, are really moderate people. And we have to give them the opportunity to, uh, to rule Syria. We have to try them. And we, we now the people are dying. It's not, it's not the time to talk about that. We have now to stop talking about protecting minorities while the minorities are, are okay in Syria. As I, as I said, I'm a Christian girl and I can, I can tell that we are really unsafe in Syria. We have not like, uh, killed uh, the, major, the majority in Syria. Who, uh, a lot of, uh, they are massacred really in Syria now, the majority, in the name of protecting minorities. That's not fair. I would just like to comment that I think that the situation is changing on a daily basis. And I think that what 
you may have happened, may have been the case when you were in Syria, it may be changing. And so I think we, we need to keep in mind that the longer this war protracts, the, the harder it is to maintain that it, it is self-contained. Self-contained, yeah. yes. So maybe you can address that, Father, you were there, you left in, in June, but also this question about um, the strength of the Free Syrian Army and its ability to actually uh, win militarily against the regime. I think that the Syrian Army today, the Syrian Free Army, is uh, stronger today, not only in number and capacities, but also in the capacity to control the all of the armed people against the regime today than what it was in winter time. I, I think that today they can be more um, correct in terms of uh, military behave in a situation like the very difficult one, one that we have today. Nevertheless, I think that is not useless to call for the protection of the civilians. These civilians in danger today are the Sunni people aggressed by the Shabiha. Tomorrow, the risk is real that the families of the Shabiha will be in danger. The Christians are in a situation that if uh, is not uh, going into a real democracy, and if a situation like Iraq will happen to, uh, to last for a long time, then I don't see much room in many regions of Syria for Christians to stay. Uh, because the infiltration of uh, extremists in the society, I will not say in the army, in the society, the presence of terrorists in the society uh, will have more rooms to develop because of the lack of international responsibility and so far the minorities will suffer. This I think is a matter of fact. We have to address this, uh, to address the international community now asking for full responsibility. Uh, and, and then we have from now, Hadil, to think in terms of constitution. We have a Kurdish issue. The Kurdish issue is growing quickly as very essential to the unity of Syria tomorrow. You come from a very sensitive area in Syria from this point of view. And you know, as I know, that the Kurdish in the Northeast are divided on the program. Some of them want to have a splitting and another uh, reality like the one in Iraq. We have people working for the agenda of the Alawistan, of the separation of the uh, west of Syria as a separate uh, re political reality. This will last after the end of the regime. So by now, we have to fight back all those dangers with a um, overacting work on constitutional level and political level in order to offer to all Syrians a perspective he can agree upon and engage in. Okay, um, we've ran over a bit. Um, if there is interest, we'll take another round of questions and, and close, but I ask you to keep the questions succinct. Um, uh, Mohammed, I'm gonna let you speak because I know that you are quite uh, uh, involved and engaged with people on the ground, if you can speak quickly and ask a question. Actually, I just have a quick comment about uh, the number of, you said that the uh, protests have, uh, you know, peaceful protests have subsided. Actually, last Friday, we had 756 uh, nonviolent protests, an increase uh, from 645, you know, a couple of weeks ago. So I just wanted, you know, for the record to uh, say that. Thank you, that's all. Okay. Uh, in the back. Hi. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm curious if you can elaborate a little bit on uh, the role of any Syrian Jews. Uh, are they part of the revolution? Um, how are they treated? 
How are they treated by the regime? And have you noticed any sort of issues that you would care to speak about involving yes. the Syrian Jews? The, the Syrian Jews are a very little community. They are not 100 persons because... And they're they, Damascus? They, yes. They left Syria in 1993 when in the occasion of the uh, Madrid process, uh, Syria agreed on the massive emigration and for Israel and the United States was good not to have a Jewish community trapped in Damascus. So they were somehow obliged to leave Syria. And this was an incredible loss for the civil society in Syria, for the culture of Syrians altogether. The Jews have always been organically part of the Arabic society of Damascus, where Arab Jewish living with the other people in Damascus in radical harmony. And we will bring back this. We, we, we hope to bring back our Jewish to Damascus as they like, if they like. Uh, this would be our proud to have them back. Because this is our concept of a pluralist society. And we hope that our neighbor, Israel, will understand that a more happy Syria will be uh, for the good of Israel and Palestine as well. OK, so um, I think, well, thanks everyone for coming you you. and for the questions. questions. Thank you, Father. Um, I know you've, you've been forced to leave your homeland and to deal the same, and I know it's not an easy personal experience, and I thank you for coming out and talking broadly about issues of Syria when you're facing your own personal trauma. Thank you for offering to us this great you. occasion thank you of for communication. This thank you very much. Thank you.